uh, I'm glad we're at least able to get together virtually. Um, it's been a long time coming since there's been a exchange uh, focused, you know, community conference. Um, I'm hoping in the future uh, we'll be able to at least see each other, see each other in person and get that in person networking experience that uh, we all kind of love and miss from the previous mech days uh, and some of the previous ignites. Um, so just give me a second here. I will share out my presentation and we will get started. All right, second time with the charm with PowerPoint Live. OK, uh, so this session is going to be about moving your WS applications and graph applications and app registrations to a application access policy model. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, if you weren't in my last session, uh, let's go over this again. So um, i had a 17 year career in the, uh, the Microsoft productivity space. Um, I've been around in exchange since well, I would say the uh, exchange 2000 days. Um, so I've, I've been uh, deleaguered and battled by some of the uh, lovely uh, earlier versions of um, exchange on premises. So uh, I've been around in the community for um, a really long time. Um, my primary uh, focuses are in uh, architecture, migrations, operations, uh, and in the consulting space. Um, I worked in the primarily in the on-premises space for a uh, long period of time up and through, I would say, uh, the end of uh, 2019 uh, to where I, cur where I currently am now. Um, at the, I'm a currently a solutions architect for professional services at Quest Software, uh, where I'm responsible in the, uh, the professional services group for architecture design and delivery um, for any, any exchange migrations, uh, no matter which way or flavor, um, active directory migrations, and uh, and tenant to tenant migrations. So before kind of got into this kind of key role, the my last on premises experience was uh, for a large automotive where we built one of the largest uh, on premises exchange organizations uh, that's still standing today until they moved exchange online is complete. So um, on premises also has a near and dear place in my heart for uh, a very long time outside of the uh, outside of the cloud business. So. My overview for the agenda today is uh, why EWS is so important. Um, and then just the overview of what you can currently do in EWS uh, is from an access standpoint, uh, what application access policies are uh, from an EWS standpoint and a graph API standpoint with moving forward. Um, I do have a demo on creating Azure app registration and applying application access policies. Um, I will go through the I'll go through the the walkthrough kind of in uh, in the Azure portal on how to create an app registration, um, and then some of the things that you'll need to know. I do have a lot of the things pre-populated at you know just to save time, um, but I'll go through as much interactively as I can. But I did want to have as much pre-populated as possible just to kind of save time for some uh, for some Q and A. So let's get started. So why AWS is so important today? So. Um, I've got uh, a person who actually contributed to this article is Mike Weaver, who's a great friend of mine in the industry. Um, he's one of the uh, he's one of the MVPs in the Office Apps and Services community. Um, so the link to partially that article, which he's got a demo on, is in the link is in the bottom link below. Um, the article was also written by uh, Vasil Michev, who's um, he's been around in Exchange for um, a very long time. Uh, very smart guy to work with. I actually miss working with him. Uh, he would be one of the guys <laughs> I would go and ask when I needed help. Uh, so the, he had a good description on the importance of EWS today. So it's still, even with the push to graph API, it's still the primary API from a development standpoint that's still used in the exchange world today, um, especially from an on-premises standpoint um, where you don't have any, um, even taking hybrid hybrid, moder hybrid modern auth out of it. Um, you know, the on-premises on version of exchange is still EWS that's not changing um, anytime soon from what I've heard. Um, so, you know, many migration products use EWS today uh, to extract data to another mailbox. Uh, you have your tools and scripts uh, that enable many that enable many that enable many many functions that you would need to do within a 
uh, within a mailbox. So, uh, you know, bulk copy, moving items, items to a mailbox and folders within a mailbox, um, any delegation rights that you might want to assign through EWS, um, assigning retention tags to items, which a lot of, you know, third party products for migrations today. Um, when trying to assign when trying to assign retention tags to um, items or folders, it's EWS today um, in on premises and even in um, Exchange Online, you might have to do it via that way too because there's no graph uh, equivalent yet. But I know they're working on that in the roadmap. Uh, and you can also fetch uh, fetch availability information for uh, it works for fetching availability information within Outlook. Um, the older um, the older Outlook for Mac client uses it for availability, um, or you can also use it for uh, for mail tips. So just the latest um, that just on an authentication standpoint in general. So um, this will be a theme that you know, Greg's kind of doing a press tour this week and um, and next week at another conference that Greg's going to be presenting at um, kind of the latest and greatest on the uh, on the basic auth journey. So um, the team put out a post on the on the Allo blog. Um, just recently, uh, some updates to uh, the strategy to end the basic auth, uh, to end the basic auth nightmare. <laughs> um, so basic auth is still going to be turned off starting October 1st for EWS and other exchange protocols. Um, the thing that has changed, uh, which which was featured in the announcement, is there's a, um, if it's not live now, it should be live soon um, in your tenants, where uh, customers can use a self-service diagnostic to re-enable basic auth if needed once per particular exchange protocol. Uh, that will stay enabled until the end of December. That will stay, stay enabled until the end of the year, and then basic auth will be disabled for those particular protocols permanently. So I know Greg had an earlier presentation on kind of the, the ins and outs of what the team has actually done to this point, um, their journey, some internal stats they haven't shared yet. Um, I believe there will be a, I believe there's a, Ask the, ask the experts on basic auth deprecation uh, that may have already taken place or is taking place today. There will be a repeat of that session tomorrow if you did miss that um, for the ask the expert uh, ask the experts, excuse me. Uh, so plenty of pertinent information there on your on that journey. So a general review on EWS access. So uh, today um, EWS on premises is controlled through uh, RBAC access. So you enable um, enable your EWS to mailboxes through um, application impersonation. So you can assign the you can assign the the man you can uh, assign that management assignment role to a, a single account or a custom security group or one of the default uh, RBAC groups built into exchange on premises. So you can restrict the management scope of the account or group to um, a particular set of mailboxes in OU um, to not allow access to the entire environment, which that's how you control it from a security standpoint there. Um, that's just a, and then you'll see it's the new dash management role assignment where you would assign the application impersonation role. Um, you can assign it to a particular security group, so a particular set of uh, a built-in default RBAC group, uh, or if you have a custom set of service accounts that are in a particular security group, which you've given access to, uh, you can also assign it to an individual user account as well. Um, and then one of the scopes you can use is a recipient organizational unit scope where uh, you can control the scope of uh, what this role, of what mailboxes this app role and account have access to. So this would be a, uh, an OU scope model. You can scope it out to an individual mailbox. Um, you can scope it out to groups um, depending on how your, how your structure is laid out and what your needs are. For Exchange Online, uh, Exchange Online today, you can still do the same where you can enable EWS access uh, to mailboxes through application impersonation within our within the native RBAC role itself. Uh, you can assign the role to a single account or um, a custom security group or one of the default uh, default RBAC groups in Exchange Online. What you can't do today is you can't uh, natively uh, natively within uh, within Exchange Online. So you can't natively restrict the management scope um, in the native RBAC model. So you can't. Uh, restrict it to a scope set of mailboxes or a particular OU, obviously, because the the OUs don't quote unquote it, they're not visible to us in Exchange Online to be able to um, to access them. So when you grant that access, you're granting it to um, all of your mailboxes in Exchange Online, which um, it's a 
potential pretty large security gap uh, that's not desired you know by the by your internal exchange team and definitely not by your security team with all of the uh, with all of the security uh, with all the security events going on today. Where we move to in uh, the EXO world um, is application access policies. So you can you can use this with uh, Exchange Web Services, or you can also use this with uh, with Graph API as well. So with app access policies, this will help your or this this helps any organization uh, restrict scope of EWS and Graph API app permissions. So you can restrict specific objects within within the tenant. Um, that the your Azure application that you would create uh, would be able to connect to. Um, Exchange Online was originally the only workload that supported these app access policies. Um, I know SharePoint, I believe, currently supports them today. Uh, I'm not sure of any other uh, not sure of any other workloads um, that currently support them today. Uh, but I do know Exchange Online and SharePoint Online um, do support them. So with EWS initially, when it was announced. Uh, and initially only uh, delegated application permissions were supported. So um, if you're not familiar with uh, the permissions model, when you create an Azure AD application, there's there's two models that you can that you can uh, use when you assign an API. You can assign um, delegated permit, uh, you can assign APIs for uh, delegated permissions, or you can assign them from a um, an application app, an app uh, application app permission excuse me it's a mouthful um, with delegated app permissions you have to sign in as the as the delegated as the delegated you have to sign in as the delegated user so um, anytime you would make a call with the delegated with a delegated api you would get a you know you would get an auth prompt to you know sign in as that user which um, for certain testing i would say would be feasible but obviously for anything long term or for anything that uh Enterprise app, enterprise application related, just it wouldn't be feasible. Uh, for the Graph API, only your initial selected, uh, uh, only only selected uh, mail APIs from the Graph and calendar APIs were supported. So you. So. Uh, APIs for app access policy. So for EWS, uh, it was, I believe, was supported early, early last year. Um, where application impersonation for application app permissions are now fully supported, where you would need the full underscore access um, AS app role, which it opens up EWS to EWS access to all mailboxes in your organization. But with the app, with your application access policy, you can at least control the scope. Uh, the scope of the mailbox as far as where um, the your app registration will be allowed to uh, access those mailboxes. So um, it kind of brings in what you can currently do an on-prem to the what you can do an on-premises today as far as being able to scope down by a user security group. Um, OU it at least gives a it at least gives you a control of the scope of uh, users um, or security groups. Uh, in the Graph API it supports the uh, Graph API for app access policies today uh, currently support uh, the, those part these particular APIs. I won't read them all off. You can read through them. Um, but from the mail, mailbox settings, uh, calendars, and contacts is what it supports today. Uh, your Graph API allows for more granular permission to rights with mailboxes. I think where this comes in as a security win is, as you'll kind of see um, in your journey to move to Graph API, uh, you'll see that there's certain, um, especially if you use the PowerShell SDK, um, there are certain modules that you may need where you don't need access to um, all 38 modules of the Graph API for using the PowerShell SDK. Uh, depending on what's needed, um, you can go in and refer to, you know, you can go in and there's a uh, Microsoft doc that shows what what native um, APIs are set in today for EWS to Graph API. And from there, you can see if there's any native uh, PowerShell SDK commandlets that are there today. Uh, if you if you're if the the focus that you need only needs example would be um, for sending a a mail message. If it's a small attachment, for example, you might only need um, 
the mail dot, uh, mail dot send capability. So you don't even need access to actually read anything in the mailbox, which you just need the access to be able to send a message out, uh, which is a big security with there if you don't even need to read the mailbox, for example. Um, or for uh, calen uh, calendaring, if you only need access to, um, you know, get information in a calendar, you only would need, you know, calendars.read. You don't need um, information. You don't need to write anything to the mailbox. So like an example I could think of would be a, like a, a migration scenario. I know there's some, there's some, pro I know there's some third party migration products today um, that there are some dependencies on when, um, you know, it depends on how each organization wants to do things, you know, pre-migration, post-migration, but you know, there's some requirements that I've seen in real world where, um, like an example would be, you know, I see the entire folder structure in the mailbox, but then I need a queue to be able to uh, tell the user that their mailbox is ready for post cutover or, um, you know, there might be some sort of, you know, reconfiguration agent um, where they may be, um, you know, signing out and signing into their new mailbox and a new tenant, for example, in the tenant, tenant space. Um, you know how certain products uh, certain products I've seen it do today is there's a there's a polling interval where an agent you know checks in with the mailbox or from a API standpoint uh, there's some agents that uh, write a message to the mailbox whether it's like a, a hidden message that a user doesn't see but the agent will see uh, that will go ahead and tell the you you know it, it at least will report back to your your console that says hey I'm ready for post migration this message is here and I need to go ahead and do those fixes. So those regular permissions are definitely a security win, which um, especially from a third party product standpoint, even outside of the native space um, is also a is also a big win for any organizations today. So how you would go about setting this, you know, setting up your your app access policy. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is you need to set up a, a Azure AD uh, application slash app registration. So the way you would do this from a, you need to set this up for uh, for modern author OAuth. Uh, what you need to do is you need to go in and create your Azure app registration in the tenant. So I think we'll have, we'll definitely have enough time, um, you know, to go through the, uh, the demo here um, and be able to, uh, you know, go through all these steps. So you'll have to go in um, and create the application. Um, you're going to Azure, you'll go to Azure Active Directory. You'll see a section that says, uh, Azure app registrations, or you'll see app registrations, and then you'll go in and then you'll be able to uh, create the application, name it whatever you want. Uh, there's a, a redirect host if you need to redirect it to a certain URL. If it needs to um, redirect somewhere from an authentication standpoint with any particular reason, you can set that. Um, once you have your application uh, at least initially created, uh, what you would do is you would add your, um, you would add the EWS API or your graph API permissions to your application registration in, in the tenant. So where the application access policy helps uh, is it helps to restrict, it's restrict access to um, only your mailboxes needed, which is uh, best security practice just from a, a scoping standpoint, especially from EWS, because that's really the only op option you have. Uh, for the security of the application itself, you could do it by um, by certificate or client secret for app authentication. Um, certificate is best security practice, uh, and the reason why that reason why that is is so if you go in and creating a if you go in and create a client secret, um, one thing you just you would need to keep in mind is when you create the app secret, it only pops up once once you actually create the app secret, and then you need to. You basically need to write it down somewhere or you know copy and paste it somewhere and then make sure you don't forget it otherwise you need to create a new one um and it's also saved in it's basically saved in plain text so even from a scripting standpoint um unless you go through a whole bunch of try to go through a whole bunch of rigmarole to uh, uh to try to basically hash to, to basically hash that it creates a extra headache and i know for for some people who, you know, and for those who save your user credentials and passwords for basic auth and plain text today, please don't do that. Um, you know, there's some folks who, you know, from a you know, quick, you know, from a quick thing, will just, you know, they'll use the secret and then they'll have the secret right with it. They'll have the secret in plain text right saved into a variable, which is almost no better than using basic auth anyway. Um, at least from a, a certificate standpoint, it's more secure. Um, you would need to have the certificate in a um, 
in a location where if it's running from a machine standpoint, um, you would need to um, be able to reference that certificate when it reaches back out. Um, and it's got to be in your um, your your personal store of the current user, which it's running against or the local machine. Um, you can also hash out the certificate if you didn't want to even expose the thumbprint either, which is another um, which is another which is another security one there. Um, you know, from a client secret standpoint, it's I would say that's more for um, that's more for like I would say that's more for legacy apps that don't support certificate based authentication. Um, that's where I would say the secret would be in play, uh, which you can use both. Obviously, if it don't, obviously it depends on certain um, user requirements or what security you might have in place. Obviously, each organization is different, um, but for best security practice, it's best to use a certificate if you can use it. The next thing you would have to do is you would have to grant um, admin consent to an application. So what you will see is when you go in and add your your API permissions. Uh, when you have to do it for um, a application, at, when you when you're doing it for a application access assignment or app, application um, role assignment, uh, you'll see on the on just to the right, you'll see what the you'll see the name of the API, what it's what the description is as far as what it allows you to do, and then you may see something that says grant consent for your NetBIOS tenant name. Um, what you need to do for that is you need to go in um, signing in with a uh, with a global admin account, um, that's the that's the one catch. I know from a I know from a security standpoint. I know we're trying to restrict any access to any global admin account as much as possible. But unfortunately, the only way you can grant access, which I can kind of see both ways as to why, um, would be with a GA account only. So you may have already done this today from admin consent and not even kind of know it. So um, a lot of third party a lot of third party products for migration, um, especially from a a tenant to tenant standpoint. Um, what you would typically would do to set the environment up is you don't have to, um, especially if it's like a SaaS based application, um, like most of them are today, is you don't need to, um, you don't have to really set up any um, servers that are responsible for the migration, but you need to import um, app registrations that are hosted by the third party vendor into your tenant. So the way you would do that is your vendor would typically give you a URL um, that takes you to a screen that says, um, you know, vendor name dash whatever the application may be, and then it'll list the rights, the API rights uh, that are uh, that are allowed within the application, and it'll tell you um, each line by line. You'll see kind of the auth prompt of uh, what the app can do, um, and then on the bottom you'll see a deny or uh, deny or accept to import the application into your tenant. When you import the application into your tenant, and again you have to do that with the GA account because uh, that's the only way you can import apps into tenants today. Um, once you import that app, you'll see the uh, you'll see the application import into your tenant, and the admin consent's already granted for it. When you accept to import that, uh, the consent's already built in. Um, so you need so uh, the consent's already built in for you to do whatever you need from a a support test standpoint. Um, enabling strong encryption algorithms if legacy .NET framework is used. So depending on what your application, depending on what the app might be supporting, um, depending on what it's what it's what it's designed to do. Um, if you're using, um, if there are any backend servers to go ahead and support that application, what you may need to do, um, if there's any calls to those to um, run any of the code, and especially if dot if any .NET uh, calls are related to it, that's not .NET Core. Is if you're using like uh, the the current like .NET framework, like you know 4.8, 4, you know 4.7, 4.8. Um, what you need to do is from an ex uh, and if you have Exchange on-premises servers, like you know Exchange 2013, 2016, uh, 2019, um, you may have already done this already. Um, 2019 by uh, Exchange 2019 on-premises by default support is is native TLS 1.2 only. Uh, from a a cipher uh, from a cipher standpoint, from a uh, security protocol standpoint, it is. Uh, but the other thing you may need to do for the IIS websites, depending on how your um, on how the build of the OS is set up is you'll have to enable um, .NET explicitly uh, with the, uh, the registry calls called SCHU strong crypto, which forces .NET uh, to use a higher level version of TLS. Uh, so which is not built into uh, 2013, 2016, or even uh, 2019 today. Um, you need to have a script that goes in and does that um, if the punches aren't already there or they're not part of your build. 
Um, but if you've done that before, that's just the same. It's just the same step. So if you already have a script that does it, that's what you might need to do for that. Uh, depending on if you have anything, um, any servers on the back end that um, that you need to have any code for any particular reason run off of. Uh, the other thing you would need to do is a request access token. So by default, a request access token. So when you're connecting to OAuth, um, whether that's uh, whether that's AWS or whether that's what whether that's whether that's Graph API, uh, you need to have a access token in place because that's how the that's basically the replacement of the username and password is a access token. So you can do this in one of two different ways. The easiest way to do it today, um, if you're um, if you're PowerShell savvy, um, is using the the msal.ps module. Um, what this has is it um, if you import that module and use that as part of one of your PowerShell scripts, uh, it already has a built in function for it's called the get dash MSAL token uh, where you just need to call that. You just need to call uh, that get command and then fill in some information like your your client ID, tenant ID uh, and the certificate, and it'll create the access token for you versus you writing all that writing all that custom code. So um, it's currently versioned at a certain. It's currently versioned at a certain version today. I believe it's about a year old at this point. Um, from a GA standpoint, you can use the more modern um, identity client DLL, which I think it's at version 4.6. It's at version 4.6 now. Um, but if you're if you're using that latest and greatest, then you basically would just have to go in and basically uh, code your uh, code a function to basically pull in that token for you versus um, using that PowerShell module that already has it for you. Just um, it dumbs it down for you. We just need to provide your um, client ID or your, uh, your application ID, your tenant ID, or tenant net BIOS name, um, and the um, and the certificate, and it'll create the token for you. Uh, by default, the tokens uh, expire in in one hour. Um, so where that comes into it, where that introduces a problem um, is more from a if you've got a long you know a long running script. Um, for something in exchange online. So, um, you know, some of the modern, you know, some of the some of the needs have been taken care of with uh, with the latest and greatest uh, EXO module. Um, once basic off is officially retired, um, you'll see the um, which I believe there might be some sessions on later on today or tomorrow um, on the latest and greatest in the PowerShell module as far as what's being updated for um, REST API outside of the current get commands that you can do in the current uh, in the current uh, EXO PowerShell module today. Um, it kind of helps there, but if you still got any scripts that are EWS or Graph API based uh, that are not a native Exchange PowerShell, uh, what you need to do is have a you need to have a reference that goes in and um, that I think the best the easiest way to do it is to kind of use um, use the native .NET like stop watch commands. Um, if you've got anything that's a get or a set. Um, Depending on if it's long running, uh, what I would typically do, and I'll have it, some of the examples um, that I'll show here, um, is you would create a create a stopwatch, and then each time you need to run a get or a set, um, I would have a basically like a, a check for the minutes that says uh, if it's greater than uh, 50 or 55 minutes, uh, then I would call the then I would call the refresh, which all it is is just the uh, if you're using the MSA LPS module. Um, it's just the same get. It's just the same get command that I mentioned earlier. There's just a dash force refresh parameter at the end of it, and then that refreshes the it refreshes the token life, and then you it'll move on, and so um, it'll move on, and then your script won't your script won't bomb out if you've got something long running. I can't tell you how many um, times, especially moving from the on premises to the uh, cloud module or cloud model, where um, I had something long running from a discovery standpoint, and then I come back and I'm like, oh yeah, the script's only good for an hour until it bombs out. So, yeah. So, how to set up the app access policy? So, um, it's a native EXO PowerShell commandlet. It's new dash access, new dash application access policy. Um, so, for the parameters, you give the um, you give the access right. So I'll get into a little more on the next slide. I'll get into a little bit of a more um, ordering on the rule because it can, can get a little confusing with the way they kind of um, explain how the access rights kind of uh, work and what allows access, what allows access to what. Um, so the two parameter, the two values, um, the two values that you can set for access rights is uh, restrict access which if you use the restrict access, that means your application can only 
access data from mailboxes in what's called the policy scope group ID. So the policy scope group ID uh, is the, that's where you put your recipients as far as um, who it'll affect. So the way you kind of code it um, is a bit different. So for the policy scope group ID, if there's a individual recipient, you could put it for individual recipient to apply it to multiple mailboxes. You use um, mail enabled security groups to apply that to multiple mailboxes. Um, if you have a restrict access, so with restrict access, that means like, for example, if I've got a, a group of mailboxes and I have restrict access, that means my application can only access data from those mailboxes in that scope. Um, if I have a if I have a deny access access, right, that means the app can only access data not from those mailboxes. So um, the example would be, you know, if you've got a if you've got a certain application where you don't want um, if you don't want something to be affected to um, executives, for example, um, you know, one way you could do it is um, you could either do a applicate. You could either create an application with restrict access so that it only that that application is only used to access executive mailboxes only, which gives you kind of a more granular control of, hey, this application policy um, was was available or this application policy was used to access these particular mailboxes. Uh, for today, um, as far as a number, as far as a number limit um, on policies, um, currently today, uh, when, the, when the feature was initially, initially released, um, there was only a 100 policies, so 100, um, that was that were available to be accessed, that were available, that were available to be assigned per tenant. Um, from customer feedback, that was um, that was increased to 300. Um, what you'll see moving forward, uh, but you'll see some product announcements uh, coming up on the roadmap, um, is that Microsoft is working on a um, an app RBAC model for Exchange, which will address the scalability, pro which is the scalability problem. Um, so more to come on that. Um, I know there's some exciting stuff coming out on that, coming out on that space, which kind of widens more of the scenarios of um, what you would use these for. Um, so the application ID is the the GUID of your app ID um, <coughs> created in Azure. And so um, I've got a example below where um, you know this app access policy example would block EWS access. Uh, to mailboxes, so the app IDs, your 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 app ID GUID um, access right is deny access, and then the policy scope ID would be the name of the security group or for the uh, the the name of the security group for those mailboxes that are in that security group. So with that app model, um, it would allow. So if you have like obviously if you have if you have a hundred if you have a just say like a small tenant you have like 500 mailboxes if you've got 50 mailboxes in this security group affecting this app access policy model you could uh you would basically uh ews access is allowed to those 450 mailboxes but then when you hit one of the 50 mailboxes in the security group um that's where you'll get the the access denied so here's the rule order which i know like i said it's a little bit confusing so um i did find this this rule order so um, it's most security to least security. So uh, deny access action will take priority over um, restrict access. So if a if a deny policy exists um, in the app policy and it's assigned to that mailbox, the app access request will be denied. If a restrict access policy exists for the application of the mailbox, then that request would be granted. If restrict access policy exists for the application, but it doesn't match a mailbox, your app access request would be denied. So um, if you're allowing, example would be on the on that third bullet point, um, on that fourth bullet point, is if you have a restricted access policy where um, you're allowing EWS access to 50 mailboxes, for example, and you hit one of the mailboxes that's not in that group, you're going to get an access denied. If no conditions are met, um, if no conditions above are met, then your app access request would automatically be granted to that particular mailbox. So your PowerShell scripts to kind of test the policies out. So um, if you're using EWS, um, import the EWS managed API, um, import your ADL client DLL, uh, create your connection to the mailbox via a new EWS service if you're still using EWS, uh, or the Graph PowerShell SDK with the Azure AD app with the rights. Um, and then test access of an API in an application against the mailbox with the policies applied. 
So I'm going to switch to um, I'm going to switch to a demo environment. Uh, let's we'll see if uh, hopefully my my demo acts nice today and everything works because you know that always happens. Okay, so assuming anybody, everybody can see my uh, my VS Code screen here, um, so I've got some some sample code that um, that I worked on as kind of a a real world uh, real world life scenario of um, I was brought onto a project about a month month and a half ago along with three other folks on my team. Um, there were some post migration issues with just kind of order of operations and throughput with things um, that uh, were looking to be um, that were looking to be done post migration. So there was a lot of um, you know recoding and rehauling with um, how things were done to kind of input to improve the throughput. So I took some samples of um, things that we were working on here. So um, you'll see at the top here, these are the modules that I'm currently importing um, for this particular set of examples. So I've got the msalp.ps module, um, which is the uh, the identity client DLL um, is associated with this module. Um, I have four uh, four graph four four graph module four graph SDK PowerShell modules. So I've got the authentication, users.actions, uh, mail, and calendar um, in these examples. And then I've got obviously importing your um, Exchange Online Management for Exchange PowerShell. So these are the parameters that I'm using across the board here. So that's my client ID, tenant ID um, to authenticate against, and then the thumbprint of the certificate. So just kind of going over um, how to create the EWS connection. So this is the sample code that I have here. Um, so this is loading the EWS uh, binary for the DLL files. So finding where the DLL is and then adding that path. Um, this adds the uh, identity.client DLL for where it's installed on my machine. And then here's where it tries to obtain the token um, in, EW, uh, the, in EWS. So I've got my certificate where it matches my my thumbprint that I have in my parameters. And then here's the here's the get command that I was telling you about that's in the P MSAL module. So it's this get dash MSAL token. So for doing it with a certificate, it asks for your, your client ID, uh, your tenant ID, and then your your object certificate, and then you have the uh, the scope. So your your scope here is just the default office.365.com instance uh, with the dot slash default. And then um, how I have it here is uh, this is the first command that's run um, if a refresh is not called, uh, where it grabs the token. If you're calling for a refresh, uh, there's this dot dash force refresh parameter here that refreshes the token. This will set the credentials. Um, so we're setting the data version. Uh, we're setting the UR, uh, the exchange version. We're setting the uh, the EWS URL. And then here's the credentials parameter where it's doing the web services .data .oauth credentials. And then my argument list is the access token that I'm pulling from this function here uh, to connect to uh, to connect to Exchange. Um, any imper any impersonation I might need to do if I'm impersonating someone else. Um, and then if I'm referencing my timer for token refresh, so I'm using the object stopwatch, which is a, a native uh, .NET PS um, functionality. So I'm checking to make sure that it's running. And then um, if it hits that token refresh, I just do a, um, I do a start new um, if I'm doing an initial connection. And then if I need to, re if I, once a command is, um, it starts new if there's not a stopwatch that exists. And then if I'm doing a, if I'm doing a refresh and I get a ref and I have a refresh commandlet, um, it'll do a re it'll do a restart command. So what I have over here is these are my examples. So um, it's connecting to Exchange Online um, and then it's creating the application access policy. So I'm allowing EWS access. This is my app ID restrict access, which means I'm allowing access to these. Uh, particular mailboxes within this policy against the application that's set to this uh, mail enabled security group that I have created in my tenant. What I have here is testing the app access policy. Uh, so what this is doing here um, is I have where it's pulling, um, impersonating myself and then pulling some delegates. 
Um, I'm in this. I'm in my 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 dev my dev account here is in this uh, is in this app access policy. This uh, this app ac this user is not in the app access policy. So if I'm getting a um, I would get a successful return back from EWS here, but then I would also get I would also get a access tonight here. Um, and then from a graph standpoint, um, if the graph API is supported, uh, what I have here is a you know this user is not in the app access policy. So if I try to send to this user, I would get a I would get an access denied. So if I copy this here for graph. And I run my function. OK, so you'll see in this message here, you'll say um, this is the command that this was the graph SDK command that was used. So the send MG user mail and then you'll get a you get this access to O data is disabled. So if you get this here, that means that the app access policy, the way it was configured, sees that this account that was specified in here, which is this Diego S account. Um, was not in the app access policy that uh, that allows for uh, this this graph API behind this commandlet, which is uh, gmail.send, and then you get the access to uh, O data is disabled. If we do it via this function here, which is me. Send mail. You'll see I didn't get an error back. Um, and if I look at my, if I sign in, I should hopefully. have a message in my mailbox. And that's the message that I just uh, sent to me because I was the sample user. So um, you'll see some of the formatting here. So um, this didn't come through right, but at least in here you'll see the attachments that were set across with the message. Um, I was sending it to myself. I'm a user that's in the app access policy. Um, so this worked correctly as designed. Um, I know we can only have a few additional minutes here, so I will go through the um, the portal here just to show you how the uh, the app was created. So if we go to app registrations, um, and I use this here. So in this application, you'll see here. So this is one that I've um, this is one that I've created. Um, you'll see for the um, authentication. So when you create an app registration, you basically get this where you basically create the name. You'll get these supported account types um, where you'll get uh, accounts only in this directory, only just this tenant or if um, or if you need to for any particular reason for multi-tenant, um, you could decide that as well. Um, from a certificate standpoint, you'll see here um, I've uploaded a a certificate. It's just a self-signed certificate that I created just for testing. Uh, here's the thumbprint. I don't have client secrets assigned to it. I'm using certificate based off for best practice here. For the API permissions, you'll see a bunch of API permissions. And the reason why this is is because I'm using this for um, my Microsoft 365 DSC testing. Um, but what you'll see here, what you'll need to add for um, Office 365 Exchange Online, you'll need to add this full access AS app if you're doing it for um, EWS web services with full access to mailboxes, and then you'll add the particular um, for graph API purposes. It supports the 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 mail these these mail APIs here, this mail these mailbox uh, settings ones, and also the um, the calendars dot read dot rewrite and the contacts. So to add a permission for anything that you would need, if it's if it's graph API related. Um, graph API is kind of front and center here. Um, from an app model, you're a picky application application permission, so it runs as a background service. And then you'll see the you'll see all the breakdowns here. 
you can do a search here uh, for ones that you're particularly looking for to try to get them uh, queued up at once. Um, a trick to use to find the um, the the ex the exchange online portion of it, since it's not really um, since it's not really exposed here. Uh, a trick that you could use. So if you go to APIs, my organization uses these are all of the APIs that you um, may or may not see. This is what's actually available in your tenant. So if you go to you search for Office 365, then you'll see Office 365 Exchange Online here, which that's the the app client ID. You go to application permissions. Um, there are certain um, you'll see like a, you know, there's IMAP and POP from an OAuth standpoint. You can set that there. There's certain um, mailbox settings that you can do for like cross tenant migration if you need them. Um, the ones that you'll need to be uh, concerned with um, in this model for EWS would be this uh, full underscore access AS underscore app, um, which it provides EWS to full access to mailboxes, but you're controlling the scope of uh, EWS on the uh, on the on the policy itself by uh, what users and rights you assign to the app access policy. Um, you don't need this manage as app. This is only if you're running uh, scheduled tasks. Uh, and if you're running unattended scripts in Exchange Online, uh, you need to have this uh, this enabled. All right, so um, I know we only have a. I know we only have a few minutes left, so. I'm going to try to go through and see what questions aren't answered. Um, I know Mike and Ingo, you folks have done a great job. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, I think the Q&A is wrapped up pretty well, Julian. OK. Alrighty. Um, there should be a um, a survey link um, that was posted at the beginning of the chat session. Um, please. Uh, please make sure and go fill in that feedback um, that helps us presenters. Um, say whether we did a good or a bad job um, and uh, what feedback um, you know we're kind of looking for moving forward um, for anybody that uh, wants to reach out um, yeah I can get with you to get contact information um, uh, for any any anything in the demo that you'll see here um, the the presentation uh, the, the presentation slides um, and the recording itself should be available to attendees within um, I believe it's by uh, I believe it's by the end of the week is what's being targeted for. Um, I did want to share just one last slide for any um, for future content later on in the conference here. So let's see if this will work again. Um, some related sessions uh, related to this related to this particular content. Um, Glenn Scales, who is you know like one of Mr. Um, Mr. EWS and Graph API in the community, um, along with a few others, um, he's got a great session coming up later today on developing third exchange APIs. So I think he's dot that app um, that he's been going through and how to going from EWS to Graph. Uh, for tomorrow, uh, we have uh, Michelle Derui in the morning in the in from 9 a.m. to 9.50, um, bringing exchange scripts up into the modern age, um, where he's going to be talking about how to move your authentication from a scripting standpoint to um, kind of just similar models that we've talked about. Uh, Tony Pohl will have a modernizing your um, exchange web services apps uh, with Microsoft Graph. So um, that'll be some great information there. Um, I know Ingo, I know Ingo's presenting. Ingo, are you today or tomorrow? I know you've got a presentation too. You can throw it in the chat too um, if you haven't already presented, but I know Ingo's also presenting. So anything that Ingo presents is also a must see as well. So um, I do thank you all so much. Um, it, it's great to see. It's great to see Mech back um, to kind of interact with the community. Um, I'm really hoping that um, you have the availability to see everybody, you know, in the community in person soon and take care. Have a great rest of your conference. Thank you, everybody.